from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Hi. I'm Abby Yokelson. I'm a reference librarian in the main reading room, which is part of the Humanities and Social Sciences Division. And on behalf of the Humanities and Social Sciences Division, I'd like to welcome you to the Library of Congress. I see we have lots of outside people here, so we had good publicity to bring you in. Um, the Humanities and Social Sciences Division offers an ongoing series of book talks and programs like this in a huge variety of subjects because Humanities and Social Sciences is pretty broad. It covers just a lot. Uh, back in 2005, I had the pleasure of introducing Thomas V. Allen and his co-author uh, Paul Dixon to speak about their Bonus Army March uh, book. And uh, Tom is a regular here at the library. We see him in the main reading room all the time, but I also see staff from different reading rooms. I know he's used manuscripts, geography and math, prints and photographs. So, <laughs> So we're always glad to see him because he's always working on some interesting topic. And about a year ago, I, I found him in our computer catalog center and I asked what he was working on and he was very excited telling me all about the Tories and the great information he had found in uh, archives in Canada and in England. And I thought it sounded like a great program for us to do. And he promised as soon as the book was out, he'd come back and do the book talk. So the book is just out, what, two weeks ago? I think it just came out. So the press club got him first, but he's, he's right starting his, his book speaking. Um, someone called me last week to inquire about this program, and I happened to mention that he had also written a book on the uh, Bonus Army March, and that caller said, wow, that's really great, a historian who can actually work in different eras, try different time periods. And I thought, well, yeah, you could peg him as a historian. His specialty is kind of uh, military history and intelligence. He, um, he got the New York Public Library, picked his 2004 book, George Washington's Spy Master, as one of the best children's books of the year. And Remember Pearl Harbor was an American Library Association notable book in 2001. Uh, spy Book, the Encyclopedia of Espionage, is uh, a major source for the, um, the International Spy Museum downtown. And you may have seen him on the History Channel's uh, Secrets of War program or on any number of other programs. He, he's frequently interviewed on TV as kind of a military history uh, specialist. Um, but it's really hard to peg him that way because I looked at the list of articles. He's been writing many, many articles for years for National Geographic, The Washingtonian, Washington Post Magazine, uh, Smithsonian. So yeah, there are a lot of articles on World War II. But then as you start to read, there are a lot of articles on China and then you get to things like uh, bird books for birding articles. And, and then you find things like um, shark attacks and inventors and discoverers. So this is a, if you can't call him a renaissance man, at least a renaissance writer in terms of the breadth of coverage. There's some seats, come on right over here. <laughs> um, before becoming a freelance writer, Tom was a reporter, columnist, and feature writer for several newspapers. Uh, managing editor at Chilton Books and associate chief of the National Geographic Society's book service. He's also a founding board member of the Writer Center located in Bethesda, and I know a number of you here are affiliated with that. Um, but I think the really great thing is he served two years in the Navy early on in his career because he's a very popular speaker on the National Geographic's um, expedition cruises, so I think it helps him get his sea legs on those cruises, his time in the Navy. So, Publishers Weekly described Tories as Allen's thorough research and fast-paced narrative provide fresh ways of thinking about the Revolutionary War and shed new light on the lives of those, from bankers to small tradesmen, who remained loyal to the throne in the face of vigorous opposition and persecution. This little quote came out before the book was published. He's been getting rave reviews since it's been published, Wall Street Journal and elsewhere. Um, following the presentation, Tom will be happy to take questions. And uh, be aware, please, that the Library of Congress is doing a webcast of this production. Also, C-SPAN Book TV is here filming. So if, if you ask a question, it's quite likely you're giving implicit um, 
um, authority for them to, to film you or at least your voice as well. So Tom. Boy, if you get it introduced by a reference librarian, <laughs> she, she knows it all. Uh, thank you, Abby. Um, I, I'm not supposed to have to plug the uh, Library of Congress, but it's inevitable. Um, a few years ago, um, I got a call from uh, an historian at the CIA whom I had met when I had been working on the George Washington book about intelligence in the Revolutionary War. And he says, uh, the Library of Congress is something you might be interested in, call this number. And I thought, wow, I mean, maybe the CIA really does that. <laughs> people who, you know, just like in uh, Seven Days of the Condor, there are people reading books all the time. So, uh, well, it wasn't quite that. Um, what had happened was the library had got a manuscript that had been written by a Tory in Connecticut during the revolution who was under house arrest for his Tory thoughts and uh, he decided he would write his own history of America, particularly the revolution. And he, uh, his name was Constant Tiffany and in the manuscript he's, he gives a look at uh, why he was a Tory is kind of folded into some other elements in the in the revolution. Well, um, the point about it was I found it right here, and it wasn't that I found it; it was found for me, which is what happens. This is a wonderful place to work. That was one of the objects that started me going on the book. Uh, I had an editor one time who said, "Don't tell me how you got the story; just write the story and turn it in." And uh, I usually follow that. But there are some really I elements to this. I also was about to say interesting, but I had another editor who says, no, I tell you it was something interesting. You don't tell me. <laughs> so anyhow, the, I started looking around at, at the idea of, of a book on the Tories. And, uh, but I, I dismissed the idea because John Adams said that you can't write a good history of the American Revolution because certain records are t absolutely missing. They don't exist. And one was the records showing why the Tories became Tories and what the British were doing to encourage the, the existence of a Tory element in the, in the American colonies. And the other set of records that he said were impossible to find were the records of what the rebels did to the Tories. And that's kind of an intriguing because he just sort of leaves it there. Well, I, I s decided I would start doing some other things and I would, and, and as Abby said, I'd come in here and find elements for it. But everything was sort of moving toward a book on the, somewhere in the 18th century. I thought of the Scot-Irish and I did a proposal, a book proposal, and an editor who saw it said, well, this is all very interesting, but why not do a book on the Tories? There hasn't been one written in a long time. So that was it. And it did become a quest for records. And what, what I, and the records were all over the place. A lot of them here, uh, a lot of them in Canada, because that's where a lot of the Tories went. And there were records in England. And there were records in the state archives uh, there wasn't any country yet, so there couldn't have been much in the National Archives, but in the state archives. For instance, in Delaware, um, it's a bloodthirsty uh, set of, of, of uh, folders in what they call their treason file, because they declared that if you were a Tory and you did anything that looked like it was uh, going to be raising arms against the, the rebellion, uh, you could be hanged. Well, that was the beginning of a discovery that one of the reasons we don't, well, I was trying to find out why is it we don't know much about Tories. I mean, I had read a lot about the 18th century and George Washington and so forth. And 
I couldn't really understand why they were standing out there and they weren't being covered. Well, two things came to mind. One was when, when, uh, when we were in Ireland, my wife Scotty and I, she, as I said in the acknowledgments, her hand is actually on these <laughs> discussions of Xerox machines where we were uh, copying documents and I could see her hand. So her hand was literally involved in the research of this book. But we, we were in Ireland and we met an Irish historian and I was telling him about working on this subject and how little there was available, at least at first glance. And he said, well, every country has a grand story. And they develop that grand story and things fall away and they go underground and they aren't seen. And I think your Tories are probably there in the underground somewhere. And that was, that was a great insight. And then the other thing I discovered was that there's a, there was a tremendous, br brutal, vicious, bloody, atrocious fighting that went on in that underground. And nobody really liked to talk much about that either, <coughs> contemporaneously. So we started trying to find a way to get the idea across. And here's one exercise which I found myself doing. I had written a book uh, for young adults on, on Valley Forge. And I sort of went back in my mind and said, um, okay, here's George Washington and the remnants of the Continental Army starving to death, no shoes, <coughs> dying and deserting by the dozens. And 20 miles away is Philadelphia. And in Philadelphia, the occupying forces of the British Army are having a grand time. They're not starving to death, they're getting three meals a day, and more remarkably, when you poke into it a little bit more, you find that um, the, there are some eyewitness accounts of the British coming into Philadelphia, the British Army. Uh, Congress had skedaddled a uh, short time before. Liberty Hall, uh, is going to have a British flag flying over it in a few minutes. And as the British come into Philadelphia, the, uh, the streets are lined with cheering people. When uh, the British start settling in, the, some of these cheering people go to the British and say, would you like to know where the rebel leaders are? And they take the British around and the rebel leaders are put into uh, a jail in Philadelphia. Well, that's the other side of Valley Forge. That the reason it was a Valley Forge, one of the reasons certainly, was that there was a great deal of hesitation <coughs> to openly support the Continental Army in a lot of areas of uh, America at a lot of time during the Revolution. And that was uh, not much of a discovery, but it, was, uh, it gave me a, a kind of insight. And I started looking at things a little more deeply. And it turned out that so many loyalists, by some estimates 80,000 and other estimates 100,000, somewhere in that range, uh, left the United States of America um, because they were Tories. They called themselves loyalists, uh, but we called them Tories, we Americans. And that's a funny thing to say. I realized very early in the game, I couldn't use the word Americans very easily in this book because everybody's an American. They, if you go back to about eight, 1760, everybody's a Tory essentially. They're all British subjects. They are, they are seeing the king as uh, the, the man whom they're going to worship every Sunday if, if as most of them were, they were Anglicans, they're gonna pray for the king and uh, they, their wherewithal, there's only one trading partner, and that's England, and that's the way things were. But as the revolution started to percolate, and the sons of Italy, uh, the sons of Italy, wow, <laughs> where, where am I? That's, uh, the sons of liberty started um, functioning in Boston and in New York. Uh, things started to change, and a group started to question the revolution. Uh, for a while it was a political 
debate, I came across a, uh, a club that was formed in Plymouth in the, uh, it was formed in um, 1770 or 71. Got to look it up, it's in the book. Uh, and it was called the Old Colony Club. It was founded primarily by descendants of the passengers on the Mayflower. I mean, there isn't a better American pedigree uh, than to say you're descended from the Mayflower. Well, a lot of the people who were descended from the Mayflower in the, in the generation of the Revolution were Tories. Well, they, found, they formed a club and they decided that they would celebrate the landing from the Mayflower every year. They didn't call it Thanksgiving, they just had said they would have a big dinner at the Colony Club, the old Colony Club. And um, by about the third year, uh, they, there are people in the club who are starting to think, I want to be a Tory, I want to be a rebel. And what happens finally is the Sons of Liberty in 1774, 75, um, say that there isn't going to be any more colony club, old colony club in Plymouth. Um, we're going to take that stone that the pilgrims said they stepped on, no proof of it by the way, but there was a stone even then that said was the stepping stone. Supposedly there were people who said I'm descended from the woman who, who, uh, whose foot touched that stone and she was brave enough to come ashore. So they took the stone and um, got a lot of oxen and a lot of strong lads in, the, in Plymouth. And they started lifting the stone into a cart. The idea was they were going to take it to the center of Plymouth and um, under what was then a liberty pole, flying from the, fl from the liberty pole as any one of several flags that represented the revolution. And when they take the stone out, it f splits. And they left one part in the ocean and took the other part into Plymouth. And that was the first uh, idea that they, they, they talk about that splitting of the stone because they were seeing what was going on. If you go back to, co uh, to cons consider t Tiffany's manuscript, he is very outraged uh, by the revolution on, on religious grounds. He says that the Sabbath is being violated again and again by the rebels. That where there had only be, been good, there is now evil. He sees a moral and, and religious basis for this. Other people saw other reasons, and I, I, tr I felt that I couldn't really go into the reasons that much because there seemed to be an individual reason for, for each person. The other thing is that there was an historian in the early 19th century who was trying to round up information about loyalists and uh, he produced uh, biographies of hundreds of them and he said he wished he could have found more but that if you have been defeated in a revolution, if your land has been taken away, if you have terrorized people and you have been terrorized yourself, you don't do much writing about your experience. Well. There was a journal that I came across right here uh, by um, a man named Stephen Jarpin. Stephen um, was, tells, he, he writes a journal uh, when he's in, in maturity, but he, he starts it with the, 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 uh, the first news coming in from Lexington and Concord, reaches Danbury, Connecticut a few days after the shot heard around the world. And uh, he's an 18-year-old kid, and he decide, and he has a girlfriend um, and named Amelia, and he joins the rebel militia. The rebel militia is, his, is, is the, the captain of the rebel militia, is one of his uncles. His father is a Tory. Father throws him out of the house. He says, took me by the arm and threw me out of the house. So he stays in the rebel militia for a short time and then thinks better of it. And he does something that hundreds 
of people, of young men, and some families did eventually. If you look at what happens early in the revolution, when the, when, when the Continental Army loses the Battle of Long Island, Long Island becomes a, a stronghold for Tories. It's a magnet for anybody who lives on the other side of Long Island Sound. All the little towns along the Fairfield County shoreline are called Tory towns by the, by the rebels because all you have to do is get in a boat and row or, so, or sail across Long Island Sound, get to uh, Long Island, and the British will welcome you with open arms, and you will find yourself among friends. So hundreds of people go across, and one of them is Stephen. When he gets there, he, um, Stephen Jarvis, enlists in the America's uh, uh, Queen, uh, I'm sorry, the Queen's Rangers. Queen's Rangers is one of 150 or more, at least 150, military units formed by Tories to fight, not just debate, fight other Americans who are rebels. And if you want, if you follow Stephen's journal, one of the first remarkable things about it is the journal is called An American's Experience in the British Army. He's not in the British Army. He's in a Tory Army unit that was formed by Tories in New York and it will fight alongside or, or independent of the British Army, but it's not the British Army. But that, when that, when that um, just like um, what happened with, with uh, Tiffany's manuscript, the manuscript for Jarvis's journal was found in a trash can and published in 1907. In 1907, we didn't want to think of the revolution as anything but the revolution, and we couldn't use the term civil war because we had had the North-South real civil war only a generation before. So the whole term civil war kind of goes away, and so does the idea of Tories. Well, anyway, J uh, Jarvis goes to war. He fights in battles off, all the way from New Jersey down to, uh, Calif to uh, Georgia and Florida. He kills Americans and writes about it. Well, he when the war ends, he's been in a, in a Tory, um, Tory regiment and had seen plenty of battle for seven years. He comes back to Danbury, Connecticut, wearing his green Loyalist uniform. The Loyalists frequently, when they got outfitted by whoever recruited them, wore green uniforms to distinguish themselves from the Redcoats. So he walks into Danbury, and he expects he's going to marry Amelia, and then they'll settle down in Danbury. And when you read that journal, you say, wait a minute, Stephen, this isn't going to happen. They decide what they're going to do is have a relative who's an Anglican uh, uh, clergyman that he will have the clergyman marry them in the local Anglican church. What Stephen doesn't know is all the Anglican churches were closed during the Revolution because Anglicans started their their services by praying for the king. And if you're praying for the king, you're in trouble. You can wind up in jail or maybe under house arrest like, like uh, consider Tiffany. Or there was also a copper mine up in Connecticut. And, there, and if you went down a couple hundred feet into the copper mine, there were little cells there and you might wind up there. Uh, so he comes back to Danbury and finds that the Anglican church is closed. They get themselves a, a minister and he marries them, and a mob comes to the house. He talks the mob down, and then the next day, the day after his wedding, the local sheriff crashes into the bridal chamber and says, uh, get out of town. What he didn't know is that if you had taken arms against the, cotton, against the rebels, in, and then you were from Connecticut, you were subject to treason and hanging. So eventually, he and his wife um, 
they try to stick it out as long as they can, but they're threatened and they finally go to uh, Canada with their infant child. And when I started looking at the, Can the Canadian exodus, what's happening is the British want the Loyalists to stay here, but the Loyalists start to feel the urge to get out. And one reason they want to get out is because they are losing their land. The confiscation of land was uh, consistent through the revolution. Every, um, every one of the states passed some kind of a law about confiscation. And there were also laws that were charging them with treason. Well, what, what they do is go to Canada because what the British see the benefit of getting a group of, Ang of English speaking British subjects up into Canada to counteract those people in uh, Quebec who are Catholic and speak French. So the, the all area of what is now Nova Scotia and New Brunswick becomes the homeland of the people who left America. And they are given axes, army rations, uh, some tents in some cases, lumber in other cases, told to cut down the trees and start some, some communities, which they do. And they're very proud of it today. And if you're a descendant of uh, one of the loyalists who came up there, you can put a UE after your name. And it's United Empire, that they had, they had helped preserve the empire. And if you want to know what the Tories wanted and what their intention was, if they had won, just look at Canada. That whole steadfast character that we talk about in Canada, the Canadians tell you that came from the fact that they were founded by non-revolutionaries, people who really kept their heads about them and, and uh, they d had gone up there and started the kind of country that they wished we had had down here. Parliament, constitutional monarchy, and freedom of speech, uh, all the little freedoms we have. And if we look to Canada as kind of cousins, then you, now you can look at Canada as even more so. These are the people who didn't want revolution. And the people who did want the revolution pretty obviously won. But I think that one of the legacies that the, the Tories had, and it's a legacy we can feel sort of tremors about today, is that no matter what you do, there is dissent, in some cases violent, bloody, murderous dissent, inside we the people. And the first generation of politicians in America supposedly learned that. And, uh, I guess the lesson continues till today. So that's the Tories um, on a kind of philosophical plane. Uh, maybe some questions about the, the blood and the hangings and the <laughs> so. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Well, no, it, it, what, what happens is you can see references. First of all, there's the little matter of the War of 1812. Uh, a lot of the sons of the Loyalists come across the border, and, and if we had the roster of who burned Washington, I think we'd find some names, uh, some of their names among them. Um, so once you get the War of 1812, which essentially New England said we don't, we're not interested. It was hard, the New England War of 1812 uh, refused to send militia and all that. So in, in uh, New England, yeah, they're coming back. Now they're coming back to what? They're coming back to uh, not having their farms anymore. They have to start it all over again. But you find references of the son of a uh, Tory marrying the daughter of a rebel and vice versa. So it starts to recover. And in particularly, in, there, there was a lot of celebration of this in Massachusetts, particularly. I mean, here's the, the center of it all, and it becomes the center of reconciliation. Um, there's no 
retribution to, to, to speak of, um, the, the, we not the French Revolution. And the safety valve really turned out to be Canada, I think. If there hadn't been a Canada, I mean, we'd still be in revolution, probably. Yeah, Paul. My recollection was that there were long periods of non-engagement between the official British Army and the colonial troops. I take it all these other things were going on constantly with them. Right? Yeah, yeah. It, um, the, the Tories, here and there, particularly, I mean, one example, w William Franklin, the son of Ben Franklin, had been the royal governor of uh, uh, New Jersey. And uh, he uh, is arrested for being the royal governor, essentially, and uh, put in jail. He escapes, and he winds up in New York, which was, of course, under uh, uh, British occupation throughout the war, and uh, starts up a, uh, a guerrilla organization, which is operating outside British hierarchical control. British Army is kind of upset about it, and they actually do use the word terror. Um, and they, um, they, they write ours on the on uh, rebel houses as an indication that you can do anything you want to anybody in that house because it's a rebel. This is basically in New Jersey. And it gets to be called the neutral ground, kind of ironically, because there won't be any armies there, but there are loyalists and, and rebels fighting each other on a guerrilla basis. Uh, so yeah, that, that if you look at the, um, the revolution kind of microscopically, you see about 700 and some odd battles and skirmishes. And 500 and some, about 550 of them involve Tory military units. The most uh, dramatic one is in Kings Mountain on the North Carolina, South Carolina border, where there are about 900 uh, rebels who have been rounded up to fight a, um, a Tory a unit called the American Legion, and uh, it, which is commanded by a British officer named Ferguson. And eventually, the battle takes place. There are a thousand Tories and 900 rebels, and uh, when the battle is over, the rebels win, and it's it's vicious. They they uh, they they will not honor the flag of surrender. Um, they start hanging people, uh, it, and. Um, Nobody on that field was anything but an American, except for one British officer. And it's kind of, to me, symbolic of the fact that you can't really talk about Americans when you're writing in this war. You've got to call them something, because they're all Americans. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the Carolinas. Was the character of the um, rebellion different there, more bloodthirsty? I mean, I remember reading about the regulator movement and so on. Yeah, what they, the British really expected strategically that if they could take the South, they could stop the revolution. It would just, it, essentially, there, all of the southern colonies uh, would become British and it would starve out or destroy the revolution. And, and they put great hope in, in uh, the loyalists that were there. One of the problems they had was they, they didn't do anything strategically. The British Army didn't want to cooperate very much with the Tories who were, and there was a caste, um, a, a class issue involved, in my opinion. The other thing that had happened is very early in the war, uh, the royal governor of Virginia declared that any slave going over to the British would be given his or her freedom and uh, a lot of those former slaves went uh, to fight for the British. Not just, the, a lot of them were called pioneers and they would build fortifications and do uh, jobs. But there was one regiment called the Ethiopian Regiment and, and across the front of the uniform it said freedom for slaves. When the, w and so this dampened uh, Southern uh, 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 loyalism, because, especially by the ruling class because they were seeing um, so many slaves go over to the British. At the end of the, the war, when the Loyalists are, are going to Canada, um, the, uh, about 3,500 slave, ex-slaves go to Canada, Canada and are given land and, and um, start a colony in, in Canada. Just as a footnote to that, about 10 
about 10 years later, um, they say we're not getting a good deal here in Canada, getting lousy land, we're mistreated, and they ask the British to send them to Sierra Leone. And essentially, they form the modern state of Sierra Leone. It's another uh, uh, result of the revolution. Yeah. Yeah. Cowboys. Cowboys and something. They, they, uh, one, one was the cowboys, and um, the um, oh, the cowboys got to be everybody uh, for a while, but there were there were green coated raiders, uh, and I, I forgot the name that they had. But mo but one of the little footnotes to history is that when when Andre is. Um, uh, leaves Benedict Arnold after having obtained the, um, the, the defense of uh, West Point. Um, he's walking along in a British uniform the, with a great coat on, and he sees uh, three uh, nondescript soldiers, and he assumes they're Tories, and says, "I'm a British officer." And they say, "Well, welcome to reality. You know, uh, we're we're n we're not." So that's how. That, that's how mixed up it was uh, in, in, in New Westchester, yeah. It was Delaney's Cowboys, Delancey's Cowboys. If you want to get out of here early, don't bring up John Copley with me. He, he is an incredible character. Uh, he, uh, John Singleton Copley. He, um, he, he, he does a portrait of, of Paul Revere one day, and another day he does a portrait of the British commander of the Redcoats in Boston. And there's a wonderful little story. He, uh, before, before the revolution, in a, in a riot against the, the existing uh, governor, his name is Bernard, um, the, the riot spills out into the halls of Harvard, and there's a portrait of, uh, of Bernard, in, uh, of Bernard, uh, in one of the halls, uh, and one of the rebels uh, gets on somebody's shoulders, I guess, and he cuts the, the section out of the portrait that would have been where the heart was if it had been a human being, and he holds up and said, I've taken Bernard's heart. Well, Harvard calls on John Singleton Copley to repair the portrait since he had painted it. And Copley shows up and he repairs it, and from then on, he's a marked man. and he. He leaves the country um, before the revolution starts and, uh, and becomes a member of the, what's called the Loy Loyalist Club in, uh, in London. That's Copley. Yeah. Good. I was just going to comment that in the South, the royal governors really pushed very hard to uh, play with the British, that there were going to be lots of royalists who were going to rise and help the British, and it just didn't come about. Oh, the, the, the royalists. Oh, yeah, there was a lot of fluctuation. There, there were people in uh, Georgia, with all due respect, anybody here from Georgia, uh, the record was six times, uh, which switched. And every, everybody was aware of switching going on. I mean, when the, when the loyalists, uh, when the British decide how to reward uh, loyalists for their service to the crown, um, they have five categories. And one of the categories is uh, took up arms for the king. That's a top category. But getting down, if you just, all you did was desert from the Continental Army, uh, to uh, go over, that's a lower, le a lower ranking loyalist, cause there, but there were a lot of them. And you're right about the royal governors <coughs> in the South were absolutely fighting for the British and doing all kinds of things to, to further the, the British. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, you probably read Oliver Wiswell as a kid. I wonder if you No, I got to tell you. Oh, I, I grew up on it. I know. And but I wonder what you thought of it after generations. Well, I, even as we speak, Amazon is sending me a copy because, no, because I, wouldn't, I didn't want to read any fiction about the uh, revolution. I didn't want it to leak into my head. I'm curious what uh, you think of him as a but, I've, but I've heard a lot about him, of course. That, and in fact, I came across someone who, um, whose family, who, when he was uh, 14 years old, his uncle presented him with a copy of the book and said, we were always ashamed that we had Tories in the family, but if you read this, you'll understand why. So this is. Uh, I did the same thing. Uh, I'm from Connecticut, and I married a man who was raised a communist. And before we were married, I asked him to read the book and make sure he knew he could do it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a. Uh, I, I I also f uh, ran into someone whose um, whose name was Harrison, with one R. Well, stop and think. I mean, it's a misspelling. And she went through her whole life saying, no, no, it's just one R, because the Harrison family said the ones with the two R's were Tories and the one with one R were rebels. <laughs> and uh, they, they, they got two lineages, um, and, uh, and it has this one R difference. Oh, yeah. I have UE after my name. Oh, wow. <laughs> great. Are you from Virginia? I'm from Connecticut. They um, fought with, in green uniforms, Cherry Valley, upstate New York. Oh, yeah. William Johnson's people. Um, ended up in New Brunswick. But one of the reasons why loyalists came back down here, there was very little arable land. Uh huh. If you're in Ontario and you go anywhere north of Toronto, I mean, that's the end of it. Yeah, that's you great. Move west. Because there was Ounces Bay Company. You had to go around the lakes and just the Canadian Shield. The only way that you could get any arable farmland was to go south. So 1820s, they're all flowing through Detroit into, into what would be a, a much more arable land. But it wow. was an automatic go down. Uh -huh. so, uh, so That's a good it one. just wasn't the land available for, for farming. Mm -hmm. They had, um, what happens the, up in, New, in um, uh, Nova Scotia, it, there are so many there, they cut this, they make the second province of New Brunswick, and that is absolutely run by ex, um, by ex American. I mean, ex people used to live here. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, one, one of the, I mean, the basic issue you could see between the rebels and the, and the loyalists are just the two mottos of the country life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, peace, order, and good government. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And they certainly well, you you your testimony to it. I mean, that this is this is the difference. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I I was so struck by it when we were up there doing uh, research on it. Uh, and uh, you know, old John Adams uh, would be interested in some of the records you come across. Um, he's the one who estimated that what's one third of he is accused of having it, but it wasn't quite what happened. But when you try to get the numbers, um, you can go anywhere from 20 percent to 40 or so percent of the populace was uh, was either a Tory or a sympathizer of Tories. Um, I know a couple of people who uh, read the um, manuscript and then the book um, uh, before it was published uh, were very surprised that we won. The Dutch settlers have settled, have settled New Amsterdam many decades before it was New York. Uh, they have particularly uh, difficult Tory versus loyalist issues. Oh, yeah. Did the Dutch settlers uh, who became colonists uh, when it became New York, did the majority of them tend to be loyalists or was it the other way around? Oh, um, it's t again, I, I, my, one of my biggest files about that thick, and it's, the name of the file is Numbers. I was always trying to figure out how many of these there were and how many of those. There, there were enough Dutch <coughs> Tories that they were, there was a group known as the Dutch Tories. And there was a, a schism in the Dutch church. And, uh, and the schism went right along the lines of Tory or rebel. Uh, and they were focused in, uh, uh, pretty much in, up in New Jersey, 
um, across from um, Staten Island in that area. Uh, and there were a lot of them. But they don't seem to have um, shown much of a profile in subsequent history. You just see references to them in, when they're talking about contemporary raids in, in that area. But they, yeah, they were called the Dutch Tories. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering, do you deal with uh, the American Indians as Tories? I was thinking of someone like Joseph Brandt. Yeah, it, uh, if you look at the book cover, there, there are two Indians on it. And uh, the, the whole point of the, of the, of the cover is Britannia uh, stretching out her mantle to protect all the various kinds of Tories there were. And she's protecting the Indians because the, the uh, yeah, the Indians, along, particularly along the New York-Canadian border and uh, in Mohawk Valley, were uh, absolutely on the Tory side. And uh, they had been nurtured by uh, the British ever since the French and Indian War. The British had, had uh, something called the Indian Department. And the Indian Department allied itself with, uh, with resident Tories and produce murderous raids along the uh, Mohawk Valley, Cherry Valley, Wyoming Valley, that whole area. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, what was the legacy of the Great Awakening, uh, Jonathan Edwards and all that? Did those people tend to follow the, uh, the divine right of kings idea? Did they follow the, the, uh, the Patriot Party? Basically, it was, the, uh, I, I, I stayed away from really plunging into that because it's, um, it goes back to very deep roots as to who was who. And there were even debates uh, at the time about whether the Puritans uh, were essentially the origin of rebellion and um, that, that there was a religious basis, as Tiffany finds and other people did, that, um, that the, the worship of the idea of a, of a god, that, uh, of a king that had divine authority was all over the, the revolution. And the, uh, the Presbyterians would not take an oath to the king, and they get lumped in with the, uh, with the rebellion, with the rebels. And so when you see a church that's going to be burned down by rebels, it's going to be an Anglican church, and if the church is burned down by uh, the uh, British or the Tories, it's going to be a pres Presbyterian church. So yeah, religion is there always, and uh, I mean, not to go on and on, but I mean, I, I, uh, I had a, a chapter I worked on about religion, and I couldn't get anywhere with it. It was just too complicated um, for a narrative. But for a special study, it's, it would be very interesting. Yeah, what about the Quakers? They were reluctant to fight on either side, but where yeah. were they sympathy? They, the accusation is all over the place that they claimed that, well, we don't want to fight because we're Quakers, but in reality they were profiting by, it, literally profiting in Philadelphia from um, being on the Tory side. When, uh, when the British leave Philadelphia and uh, it's now being run under a military governor, Benedict Arnold. Uh, he, he fights the idea that they're going to have a, a, a massacre of, of uh, Quakers. When the, the, when the rebels come back into Philadelphia, there are a lot of private grievances that they want to settle. And, uh, and Arnold is against it because he's becoming Tory-esque <laughs> at this point. He's marrying up, marries a, a Tory uh, girl. Um, and and um, they finally hang two uh, two traitors right after the reoccupation of uh, Philadelphia by by the uh, rebels, and they're both Quakers. Mm. Yeah. Can I ask a rather general question? Uh, why did the Tories lose? Is it, is it because huh. <laughs> you were of them then of the Patriots? Were the Patriots better organized? Because it seems well, like. It seems like uh, when, the, when the British lose a battle, then the Tories are through in that area and have to run for safety. Yeah. But the, the Continental Army gets whipped time and time again in all sorts of places, and they still manage, the Patriot cause still manages to 
survive. And British officers actually complained about this, as you point out in your book. That well, allegedly, that, that, you know, the Tories are fair weather friends, or there aren't there are never as many of them as there should be, and so on and so forth. We'll see if this sounds familiar. We're going to send some soldiers over to train the Tories. And the, the soldiers will, will fight and go forward. And behind them, they leave behind the Tories. The Tories will govern the areas where the British have swept through and won the day. Well, it doesn't happen. Uh, primarily, I mean, there's, there's one, uh, one book on the Southern strategy that really focuses very hard on this. Um, they, they underestimated the, the number of people who would stand up and say, I'm a Tory, I've got a gun, I'm going to kill somebody. Very, uh, a lot of them did that. In fact, uh, uh, General Green of the Continental Army says that he was amazed by the savagery, he uses the word savagery, and murder that he was seeing when the Tories and the, uh, and the rebels collide in the wake of the, of the British. So it just didn't work. It was a good idea. And it could have worked if the British had integrated their uh, strategies more, um, more closely. See if this sounds familiar. They couldn't get along too well with the native people. Um, so it never really came to be. Thank you very much, Tom. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.